Luffy and Kizaru took the cover of the magazine this week, and I really like the Pika Pika version of the logo. From there, we have an amazing color page dedicated to Zoro. The face obscured by flames appears to be that of the legendary sword god Ryuma in his prime. The name of this color page is 103 Senses, Soaring Jigoku Dragon, Jigoku being the hell of Japanese Buddhism. Hopefully we can get something similar for each member of the crew. We pick back up right where the action left off last time. Vegapunk Atlas just issued a command to all pacifistic units. They were to eliminate all marines currently on the island. Overhearing these new orders, the many marines began to realize just how bad things were about to get for them. Each of the mechanical men responded to their new commands by targeting all the marines around them. Things suddenly took a turn for the worst. Many tried to run away, but were blasted all the same. The scene was horrific and a true testament to the danger posed by the pacifista. For this order to be issued, however, required the appearance of Dr. Vegapunk, who was, of course, their primary target in this invasion. Stella told Atlas to begin searching for Bonnie. Atlas slipped through the bubble top of the Vega tank and began calling out for Bonnie, just like Stella wanted. Sanji joined in on it too. Frankie was concerned to see that they were driving straight down the center and was afraid they might fall. Stella explained that the Vega tires on both sides of the tank were made of the same sky clouds as the road. This stuff has a unique ability of sticking to itself so they don't have to worry about falling. All of a sudden, Sanji claimed to have found Bonnie before anyone else. Frankie tried to get a closer look, but had to wonder if his friend was sure about that. The mere notion of his lady radar failing was enough to enrage the cook. Stella admitted that despite this so-called Lady Radar lacking any scientific backing, he was willing to believe in it too. Sanji was happy to hear it and bolted downward with incredible speed. If the Vega Tang couldn't keep up with the speed of his restless heart, he had no problem rushing ahead of them. Just then, Bonnie was also spotted by some Marines. But the timing wasn't so bad since the pacifistas were now on her side. One of the Vice Admirals, whose name we still don't know, used a clam on a stick to destroy the rubble she was hidden behind. Bonnie then twirled a gun from her hip as she heard more Marines call out after her. Turning back with incredible acrobatic form, Bonnie shot the three Marines with her power by way of a near-death experience. This still unnamed devil fruit of hers has so many capabilities. One of the men clutched onto his own forehead and was suddenly met by the sensation of death. It was so overwhelming that he collapsed. It was as if the three had been hit by a haunting application of Conqueror's Hockey. One of the men was foaming at the mouth after apparently seeing the afterlife. In the meanwhile, Bonnie continued to escape. At the very least, it looks like this Vice Admiral cares more about the well-being of his subordinates than he does about taking down Bonnie. But in front of Bonnie was one of the pacifista claiming that he would not let her pass. Considering she's Kuma's daughter and all, this was really unsettling for her. She wondered how this was possible. Not to mention, the pacifista were supposed to be on her side right now. The person responsible was Vice Admiral Bluegrass. The small elder clung onto the robot's back as it charged up a laser beam. The Marine explained that this was the only pacifista unit that hasn't been influenced by Vegapunk's orders. That's because she made it her personal ride. Thanks to her ride ride fruit, she can hijack and control anything. Which is definitely a cool ability that I would love to see more applications of. Bluegrass hoped that by getting rid of Bonnie, she would be able to restore her subordinates to their rightful ages. The third generation pacifista continued to prepare its attack, but Bonnie remained still. Even now, she couldn't bring herself to harm her father, even if the robot only shared his likeness. But just before she was hit and Bluegrass could restore their lost years, Sanji got her out of the way. He immediately told her that she can't allow herself to freeze up like that. Bonnie was surprised to see him. He knew that Kuma was her father thanks to the others, but even still, she needed to keep a cool head. Overhead, the same Vice Admiral from before prepared to strike in his Zoan form. Turns out this guy's got an otter Zoan fruit, so it explains the whole clam thing. Sanji managed to avoid the strike too, and was focused on getting Bonnie out of danger. It kinda looks like Sanji might be straining to lift her up here, but that's so hard to believe that we can just assume that he's really focused on evasion. Stella finally caught up to the two with the Vega tank and told them to get inside. Atlas told them that they needed to head back to the upper level. The pacifista were already on their side down here, so they wouldn't need to worry about the marines as much. There was nothing left for them to do in this location. Meanwhile, in the Labo Stratum, Luffy and Kizaru were still duking it out. Kizaru reminded Straw Hat that he has a job to do, one that he won't be able to fulfill if they keep playing around like this. And wow, Luffy actually has the guy panting for breath at this point. It may not be the overwhelming display of Yonko dominance that some have hoped for just yet, but to have even done this is quite the feat and certainly an indication of how much stronger Luffy's gotten compared to before. Luffy responded that that's the plan. 
This was him doing his job. Unable to defeat the pirate, Kizaru decided to run away at the speed of light. So Luffy chased after him while racing across the sky. But while he was in transit, Kizaru felt something odd. Luffy continued to chase after him, giving no clear indication that he noticed anything, which is peculiar as we'll see. Zoro noticed it too, and Rob Lucci looked totally disturbed. Jinbei's eyes went wide in response to the sudden appearance of such an ominous presence. Nami, Usopp, and Chopper were in a rush and totally oblivious to what the others were feeling. They seemed to be transporting Stussy. She did take a nasty hit from Rob Lucci to protect Stella after all. Although, we don't have a clear look at the person, and what looks to be a somewhat long nose is kind of throwing me off a bit. It would be interesting if this was Vegapunk Shaka without the helmet, but I'm doubtful. One of the unnamed vice admirals seemed to recognize the sensation, but was in total disbelief. Just then, a booming, maybe even sinister voice commanded all pacifista units to cease all action effective immediately. And just like that, they all stopped dead in their tracks. Atlas was the first to point out the strange occurrence, seeing as the pacifista weren't trying to protect them anymore. She questioned if they had forgotten their orders. There was only one group of people with higher authority clearance than the Vegapunks, the Five Elders. In an instant, a seemingly magical sigil surrounded by flames and rippling with Conqueror's Hockey appeared in the middle of the battlefield, much to the astonishment of the Marines around it. Stella recognized the danger and knew that they needed to hurry back up. Something was coming. That's when one of the most ominous marine broadcasts of all time blared over all communications devices. All marines on Egghead Island were to be advised. St. J. Garcia Saturn of the Gorosei was about to make landfall on their location. Even the marines were quaking in their boots after hearing this. But it gets crazier. Any marine below the rank of Commodore was therefore ordered to avert their gaze. Those who failed to comply would not be forgiven. The world government is not very fond of revealing its secrets. The dark booming energy erupted even higher than the Vega tank. They had no idea what that explosion was. After hearing the announcement, Atlas was surprised that one of the five elders actually came to Egghead. Frankie questioned who they were. Stella explained that they are the most powerful authority figures in the world. Much to Frankie's shock. But according to the doctor, that didn't matter since they were hightailing it out of here. Looking down, Sanji could see that something was emerging from the magic circle. Upon closer inspection, we can see the number 5 written all around a star, which is rather fitting. And it seems like this is something Oda has been teasing us with for a very long time. From the first time we saw the five elders, there were relatively similar sigils on the walls of their room. Not to mention the fact that there was a cult that believed they managed to summon Brook with a magic circle. They heralded him as Satan. With Japanese pronunciation in mind, it's more like Satan, which sounds a whole lot like Saturn. Perhaps the horrible legend of his power managed to survive the test of time despite losing out on precious details. Scary stuff, but we're only just getting started here. The warrior god of science and defense has arrived. One of the lower ranking marines was foolish enough to look directly at him wondering if the world ruler was some kind of monster. His comrade tried to quiet him down since they weren't meant to see the guy, but it was too late. With the mere gleam of his eye, he forced the Marine's head to violently explode. And with this, we have the full-fledged reveal of St. J. Garcia Saturn in his awakened Zoan form. This thing is horrendously terrifying. Elongated claws, massive bullish horns and ears, an overflowing bundle of hair, wretched spider legs, a massive cane, which I'm wondering and hoping is a weapon of some sort since he definitely doesn't need help walking with so many legs, rippling conqueror's hockey, and a flowing dark mane of clouds. What an utterly disturbing sight to behold. This thing sure as hell isn't any animal I have ever seen. The monster of a man almost couldn't remember the last time he had come to the world's surface. This guy is clearly ancient, but that's unlikely to be the classification of his devil fruit. We know that Zoan types can be all manner of things, but it seems like this may very well be our first yokai, or Japanese wrathful spirit. With that in mind, his devil fruit is likely related to the mythological creature known as Ushi Oni. Oda also teased this way back when with the color page of chapter 858. In it, Luffy was angrily facing off against an ox with the same scar as Saint Saturn. 
The football playing ox even has tattoos that look like the markings on Saturn's spider legs. I actually saw this like a week ago while rereading chapters, so I'm impressed to see that there was yet another easter egg to be found. Which is why we always pay attention to color and cover pages. But yeah, this form of his is based on an ox-headed spider that torments and feasts on men. Bonnie shivered while looking at the thing, but Sanji's attention was focused on the threat above them. A beam of light rushed down in their direction. Once it severed the clouds, they began to plummet. It was Kizaru, and he just barely missed them. It was then that Luffy finally managed to catch up. Flexing his bicep like Popeye off the spinach, Luffy told the Admiral to hold on a moment. As playful as Kizaru can be, he was getting pretty tired of playing cat and mouse. He wondered if Luffy hadn't reached his limit with Gear 5 just yet. It's unclear how exactly Kizaru knows that Luffy has an upper limit. It could be through sheer experience and battle sense, or maybe something more. Either way, Frankie called out to his captain and let him know that they were counting on him here. Luffy was more than up for the challenge as Kizaru fired a beam of light, and Luffy tanked the hit. He rapidly spun around while preparing an attack of his own, one that was too quick for even Kizaru to evade. This was Gum Gum White Star Gun. With a hulking extension of his hockey-enhanced arm, he slammed his fist into the Admiral's head, stretching it violently as physical stars emerged. This is a new one. Very interesting that the name includes the word star in it, given the circumstances. But what are those stars? Is this similar to how Bonnie knocked out Vegapunk's golden years? How crazy would it be if Luffy knocked out Kizaru's allegiance to the Marines and world government? Maybe it's a bit out there, but he is the warrior of liberation after all. Even while he was being hit, Kizaru knew how bad this was. And just when we needed him the most, just when we were on the verge of a One Piece battle of gods, Luffy reached his limit and began to fall. Of all the presences involved, St. Saturn looked at Luffy, or rather Nika, grimly. Luffy and Kizaru crash into the ground in different directions. This also gave us another look at the warrior god's form. Thankfully, despite being exhausted, Luffy is still in gear 5, so there's still hope. But sadly, the Vega tank was at its limit and broke apart as they all fell out. Even worse, they fell right in front of this oversized Final Fantasy boss monster. Frankie immediately checked to see if Stella was alright. Sanji still had Bonnie in his arms, but his care for women extended to Atlas as well, who claimed to be fine. Stella correctly assumed the being before them to be Saint Saturn. He's met the Gorosei before, but certainly not like this. Saturn confirmed his own presence and recognized that Vegapunk had managed to cling to life despite their efforts. Out of nowhere, a fury welled up inside of Bonnie as she recalled Kuma's memories of the past. The memories that shifted her from seeking revenge on Vegapunk to apparently holding a grudge against someone else. She leaped from Sanji's arms and grabbed hold of a nearby sword. Bonnie was now airborne. In the memory, Saint Saturn gave the order to completely erase Kuma's individuality so that no trace of him remains. By plunging the sword into his flesh, Bonnie committed one of the most sacrilegious acts possible by drawing blood from a world noble of the highest accord. The Elder said that the Marines could leave Bonnie B not too long ago, but it's hard to believe that that will still be the case. The ancient yokai stared at her grimly as tears flowed from her eyes. I'm surprised to see that the blow wasn't repelled by Armrim and Haki, but perhaps the Elder allowed her to do so, or he's just that out of practice. Bonnie couldn't do much at all against Kizaru, but hopefully she'll be able to make use of her devil fruit at least a little bit here. This chapter of One Piece was an absolute whirlwind of mayhem and madness. I am really loving how this arc is playing out, and I'm just as happy to know that we will not be on break next week because you cannot leave us on a cliffhanger like this. Sanji fans, this might just be your time to shine. At the moment, he's the best we've got against St. Saturn, and with two girls to protect, he should be as fired up as possible, and ready to really show us the power of his reverse eyebrows, which was teased against the Seraphim. We're lucky Saturn only told the pacifista to stop moving for now. I already know that you guys are going crazy over this long-awaited reveal, so leave us all your thoughts in the comments. We'll also be making a video on the Gorosei really soon, so if you have any ideas specifically related to them, that would be greatly appreciated. As always, I'm Slice of Otaku. Thank you all so much for watching and have an awesome day. I love you.